Tim, um, your boat's been here for a little while, and it's brand new, and also it's been the talk of the town. Um, tell us a bit about how the training has been going here, and we know you're not going to sail on the boat, um, but tell us a bit about the training you've been doing here, and how the boat is performing, and um, just a bit about who's on board your boat. Excuse me. First, let me start by saying that um, you know my wife is Australian, so I've been down here quite a few times. I've seen Sydney Hobart start several times, and uh, have become good friends with Neville Crichton over, over the years. And he sort of challenged me to do something like this. And Kenny and I would uh, Kenny uh, Kenny Reed, the captain and director of the, my program. Um, it was the skipper of Hahnemann, which was a copy of Endeavor 2. Uh, we had mo mo many of the crew that were on that, racing that for a couple of years, are on this boat. Um, they're from all over the world. But but Kenny had been a couple of times in the Volvo series, in the Volvo 70. And the, the fellows that we got to design it, very much in designing these open ocean uh, around the world racers, and so this is sort of, if you will, a, a Volvo 70 on steroids. It's it's um, it's, it's really an unusual design, pretty radical. And uh, I think, you know, if I had wanted to build a boat just for the Sydney Hobart, I would have taken the most famous, successful boat of all time in that race and copied it. But um, instead, I built I built you know we designed a boat to be in open ocean races and try to break records on, in perfect beam conditions, beam wind conditions. This boat, Comanche, will be a very fast boat in beam wind conditions. And um, it sort of means to be seen. It seemed, seemed in this harbor race the other day, it did okay upwind against wild oats, but we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. The conditions can be, um, in the Sydney Hobart can change. And even today, I don't think anyone knows what they're going to be like when we start. But it's a um, probably the most radical boat design in, the, in, this, in this race. Um, built in the U.S. in large part because we we uh, know a boat yard in, in Maine that is was capable of building it. They just needed the oven, so they chose to build the oven for it. And then we hired a bunch of Aussies to come up and do the carbon layout layout and manage that process. The actual building of it. But it just got launched um, a few weeks before it had to get on, uh, maybe a week and a half before it had to get on a container ship to get down here in time to be in this race. So it's hardly been in the water. The, that race the other day was certainly the first race, the harbor race. We chose to put all um, uh, no powered winches. I suppose there's one powered winch up front that's for furling the big sails in the front. But the, we have grinders for everything else. And when it comes to a race like the transatlantic record, that saves you a couple of three tons at the beginning because you're not burning as much fuel in crossing the Atlantic. So we wanted to have a nice, as light a weight as we could for the whole trip. And, uh, but it, it isn't perfect for around the, around the buoys. Um, grinding is, we, we had a bunch of exhausted guys the other day at the end of that race. Anyway, we're happy to be here. We've got a lot of Aussies, we've got Kiwis, we've got Americans. So it's a multinational boat as well. Jim, we've kind of talked about the get boaters to talk the town, everyone wants to know if you it the boat to end the dominance of water or something. I think that depends a lot on the conditions. Um, I'm not making that bet right now. <laughs> I have to wait and see what the conditions are. And you know, I can say for sure light air downwind we're not gonna we're not gonna be able to be. Uh, in other conditions there's some that will favor us for sure and some that we hope to hold down. If we have any downwind light air components, it's gonna be good. Your skipper's kind of said it's it's a largely untested boat. It doesn't even know if you'll finish in one pace. <laughs> yeah. I think he might exaggerate that a little bit. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the boat is obviously new, and it's a new design. Um, I would say the design and analysis 
have been pretty vigorous. The designers, uh, a French team, that have a lot of experience designing multi-hulls and monohulls for ocean racing. But, uh, and then lots of simulations, finite element analysis and fluid flow calculations, and then lots of tank testing and models of it. Design probably took close to a year in, in that sense from the time we pulled the trigger and decided to do it. And then um, it was built under Australian supervision in the U.S. <coughs> um, and um, I, I, I got confidence that, that it's built well. You, you know, these conditions can be so nasty. Lots of shock, especially right at the, at the end of Australia. Um, and the, the conditions can be any of a wide variety. Like at 40 knot wind we had here the other day, I think, I think we would have enjoyed that. But it would have been hard to keep the boat slowed down. That's the most difficult thing about this boat is getting it slowed down when the winds are high so that you don't tear it up. First you have to finish. That old thing. What was kind of the motivation to enter such a brand new boat in one of the toughest races in the world? Why did we enter this race? Yeah, well, Because it just happened to be time, the building of it happened to be time such that we could get it here. And my wife made me do it. <coughs> We've been got, got to have a look at and, and race against Wild Ice 11 a couple of weeks ago. What did you think of the boat and how, how it went? We, we were pretty satisfied, especially given it was our first real time out competing. Um, we thought we, we held our own pretty well going up with uh, Downman. They, they were a little bit faster, but, uh, and then, you know, if you've ever raced a boat, you realize that once you're not, and if you're in the lead, it's easier to stay in the lead and gain, even gain ground. Whereas if, if you're in second place, even in an evenly matched boat, it's practically impossible in up and down in races to, uh, somebody has to make a mistake in order for you to, to pass them. You may recall the beginning of the race where we got over near Point Piper. It got kind of tangled up over there and, and we managed to scoot ahead. But then Kenny um, yelled to one of the crew, go furl. Which meant furl at a big head so that we could jive around and get over on the other uh, course. And uh, they didn't hear it. They, th they thought he said no furl. And so and that, that, that sail, if you don't jive it right, it can take quite a bit of time away. So we got past there, and I don't think we ever could have gotten back into the race. And those conditions, we're not going to be able to pass one of those. But I was real happy with the upwind performance, because I mean, the only issue is the sea. It's this thing got a massive wide front end and a lot more surface area out there. We have to get it on its side for it to go. When the boat is on its side, yield over 25 degrees or so, it uh, has roughly the same weighted surface as one of those. So, you know, and it's still got plenty of power. So, um, but, but it still has more area to bash into the sea. So if it's a really heavy chop, you know, they have to slow it down a little more than they would. Jim, your uh, wife has indicated that she wants to say, uh, who will make this final decision, her or you? <laughs> she will, yeah. But, uh, I, I think she's really torn. She would love to do it, but she's got a little four-year-old, I mean a four-month-old, and uh, I'm not going to breastfeed it. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim, can you confirm for us whether James Spithill is actually doing a Rolex City photo with you? It's my understanding that he is. I, I don't, he, he was on the boat the other day, and uh, he's welcome to. He's, uh, I think he's expressed an interest in going, but um, you have to really talk to Ken Reed and Jimmy. Okay. What's the uh, potential speed, perfect conditions for like, What's the potential speed, fastest speed? In perfect conditions, that's it's a broad reach and flat water. And we already know, the boat did 30 knots those conditions, but those are very specialized conditions. 
and that was flat water. Going down a wave, of course, you can do more. But uh, I don't anticipate. I don't think we're going to average 30, 30 knots on the waves. Any more questions? Please. Just, just, just the other boat with a lot of wet is the fish oil boil. The other boat in this race is the fish oil boil that has a lot of wet as well. And um, probably it's going to look for very similar conditions to the other boat on the floor. How do you, you know, so once you've seen the fish oil boil, how, how are you feeling about that? The, the boat that's now called Vessel Oil has been around for quite a few years. And, uh, it's all of these guys have sailed on that boat or, or some variant of it. Most of the guys on my crew have sailed on it. Um, I don't know how to read it personally. I, I don't know how to, to give a comparison. Ours is a little wider, I think. Um, more recent in design. So if there has been any technological improvement since it was built, then perhaps that gives the, this boat an edge. But I'm, I, I suspect there are conditions where that boat would be faster. Well, would be. I just don't have, I don't have any gauge. I don't know, I don't even know compared to wild oats. I mean, I walked down yesterday, we were over at, uh, at the, you know, the, uh, what's it called, uh, Woolwich, uh, and wild oats is sitting right next to us. And as we came in and a little tender, I was looking up. And of course, our boat at that particular time happened to be sitting further off the, the harbor. And I didn't know it uh, off the dock. But <clears throat> I looked sighting down, and wild oats was exactly half the apparent width, the width of, of Comanche. So that, that's a lot of extra weight of surface. you got to get it out of the water in order for this thing to be spread. And, um, but I feel it's you know it's just it's just a big unknown. I really don't know at this stage. I, I noticed in the Solus race when you go down to point five a mark over the wild oats, you seem to have some bat potential bat tapes on your spinnaker. Is that some new uh, new design or something you seem to seem to give the sail a better shape? And also when you're coming back from Port Edison with right in front of you with wild oats, you seem to point higher than the I couldn't comment really on that. The the, the battens in, in the the big sails put battens in when you can. That's going to help. Um, the we, we have a little battens in our storm jib as well, which is kind of a but um, the. The conditions there that particular day, I think, I think that was just the, that was a normal race condition where you get a bunch of boats together. We happened to be in. We, we took their air. We took both oil and my boats air as we overtook them to that big sail. So they just kind of they stalled, and, but we didn't hold on to it. So my boats managed to overtake us. I, I think oil had just a bunch of problems that day. I don't think you can judge anything from that. 